uh, join webinar. Uh, sorry, I will turn off. education and society uh, and also we have already sent three best students to Deakin University and we are very grateful for uh, actually associate professor Iwanti Wijaya uh, the one who took care of our best students there so you need to be kind to her because if you are three of the best students so you will meet her again in Deakin University yeah welcome Pak Bambang <laughs> so uh, the topic today is uh, about writing for academic publication, like Ibu Dr. Desina mentioned. This is very uh, timely topic, uh, very important for us to publish, uh, not only us as lecturers, but also uh, the students. Yeah, uh, I think my publication uh, started during my MA. Uh, at that time, I uh, wrote in the newspaper but my big publication <laughs> reputable publication is from my phd dissertation and uh, from that uh, people uh, invited me to uh, to write but also uh, i write also if without invitation because writing actually need internal and external forces yeah internally we need to have like motivation <laughs> to to defeat our laziness yeah but with the external uh, forces like uh, responding to call for paper usually i can keep track on the deadline like okay the, the deadline for abstract here is the deadline for full paper and then we meet during the conference we do networks and we collaborate yeah uh, conference is a meeting please for you to share but there's also the starting uh, for your uh, publication. Okay, I think uh, I am not the speaker today. We will uh, listen to Associate Professor uh, Wati Wijaya's uh, sharing about how to write uh, for academic uh, publication. But one more thing that I would like to uh, remind you that uh, the, there are so many benefits of publications. Publications for Muslim, uh, you might know one of the hadiths uh, while waiting for the students to be seated. Ida matabnu adama in koto amaluh ilamin thalatin. Yeah. Uh, so if the person a person die, uh, all anything will be cut off at, at least uh, uh, except three things. Yeah. So that three thing is so dakotun jariyatun. That's your alam giving. Or ilmun yun tafaubihi. That's the knowledge that you share, which is beneficial. And then the third is awaladun solihun yada ulahu. That's the your children who we uh, the good children who will pray for you. So publication is uh, your second uh, long term. Uh, well, uh, it is there, yeah. Uh, the whole of your life, and after you uh, after you leave this world that will give benefit to other people yeah it will be accessible yeah so, so that's that's your amal jariah yeah and oh it, it is categorized as ilmun yung tafa ubihi the knowledge that is that's, that's have beneficial like if what today will share uh, her knowledge and this speech will be recorded and you listen uh, to her now but also her recording can be reached out listen and relation again again and again and again beyond time because it is in the internet okay i think that's all and i will uh, uh, open this session by reading basmala bismillahirrohmanirrohim assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you very much ibu destina Thank you, Professor Nina Nurmila. Okay, everyone, uh, all the participants here offline at the theater, and also those who participate through Zoom link. Uh, again, welcome to the public lecture today. And we will start the main program that we wait for. So we have Dr. Wanti Wijaya here, but first I will read uh, her short bio. So everyone has the uh, 
ideas of, about Bu Wanti. So Ibu Wanti Wijaya is an associate professor in mathematic education at Deakin University, Australia. She All right. Uh, so she is the associate head of school for international and engagement of Deakin schools of education. Uh, associate Professor Wanti Wijaya Research focuses on understanding complexity of classroom practices and examining ways to support teacher professional learning and student mathematical reasoning. Two recent and notable Category 1 and 2 grant successes are Australian Research Council, maybe many of you heard about that, ERC uh, grant, Discovery Project Primary Teachers Adaptive Expertise in Interdisciplinary Math and Science. This is from 2021 and still ongoing up to 2024, and it's worth $291,000. And secondary mathematics and science initiative for out of field teachers funded by Victorian Department of Education. Uh, before joining uh, Deakin University in 2012, uh, Dr. Wanti Wijaya worked as a teacher educator in Indonesia. And also, she spent one year as a visiting academic at National Institute of Education in Singapore in 2011 to 2012. She is an active researcher who has published extensively in teacher professional learning through lesson study, student mathematical reasoning, interdisciplinary STEM, and teacher professional notif noticing. So put a uh, in your notes so those are the areas who knows you can collaborate with her one day <laughs> all right so that's the short biography about uh, dr wanti wijaya so without further ado i will hand the session to ibu wanti ibu silakan Thank you, Dr. Destina. Can I stand? Because I don't like to sit actually when I'm presenting. So, and also I need this. Uh, so. Thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, Prof. Nina, uh, for welcoming me uh, and Dr. Destina, Dr. Bambang and everyone who's here today. Um, so it's a great honor actually for me to be here and, um, you know, uh, sharing um my experience with you but limited still limited experience i feel like i'm still uh i still have a lot to learn uh from this process so i'll begin by maybe shortly oh i think i moved too fast let me try again oh sorry did i move go back Okay, I'll start with a little bit of background about myself. So I think Budestina already mentioned that I'm from Indonesia. So you can tell from my name, I think uh, I'm Indonesian. So I grew up uh, in Cirebon. I don't know how, how many of you know where Cirebon is? Oh, okay. <laughs> There's some people from Cirebon. That's excellent. So yeah, I grew up in Cirebon. So I was, well, I studied in <laughs> Santa Maria, it's the Santa Maria, if you know. Uh, so from kindergarten to high school, the same, the same school. And then I went to Jogja for my undergrad at Universitas Sanata Dharma. Um, then I worked there as a lecturer after I finished my undergrad. I was invited to apply for, as a um, staff member uh, at the university. So I studied for mass education. I'll talk a little bit about my inspirations and um, the people who inspired me and my teachers. Um, and then I had the opportunity to uh, went to uh, study in the United States for uh, my master degree. So all scholarships, so I didn't pay for myself and PhD in Melbourne University. So um, then, after I finished my PhD, I went back to Indonesia for about two and a half years. Uh, then I was invited to go to Singapore uh, and, um, you know, had a very great, great experience there one year working together with colleagues at National Institute of Education in Singapore. And then after I finished my contract, I went to 
um, Deakin University, to join Deakin University. That's where I am now still working there. Uh, and I enjoyed partnership, research partnership and collaboration with colleagues from many countries. So there's, those are just some of the countries that I listed that really influenced my research and um, publications that I wrote reflected that uh, journey. So you probably heard about the quote, uh, the famous quote from it's like Newton, you yeah? know, uh, who, who, who knows who's uh, actually saying the standing on the shoulder of the giant. <laughs> you check, <laughs> maybe you check. Yeah, it's made famous, I think, by Isaac Newton, but it's actually dated back early, much earlier than that. But the, I really like that quote because I think when we reflected about our own journey, education journey, we always think of our teachers in the past, right, who inspired us to be who we are now. Um, so everyone has their own heroes, the one who made them want to um, pursue education. <laughs> Sometimes I get emotional when I reflected about this. But for me personally, I wanted to become mass education, mass educators because of my high school teacher. So the high school teacher inspired me so much to become math educator. Um, after that, of course, uh, throughout the, the career, the academic career, also when I did my PhD, my, my PhD supervisor is my inspiration also. So she inspired me a lot, um, Professor Kay Stacey. Um, also, uh, Professor Li Peng Yi from Singapore, he's very wise and, you know, I really admire his vision in terms of, you know, growing the mathematics education community, not just in Singapore, but also in Southeast Asia and supporting talents from other countries to come and study and work together to support the growth of math education communities all over the world. So I think that's very admirable. And in terms of lesson study, I admire the work of uh, Professor Akihiko Takahashi, for example. Uh, it's amazing. So if you had the opportunity to watch his lecture, highly recommend it, like especially when he talk about problem solving, teachers, professional development and professional learning. So, but we are here today to share or focus on academic publication, right? So how many of you are kind of currently working on your research and thinking about how can I publish out of my research? Anyone is in that stage? Okay, quite a number of you. So that's great, <laughs> including Dr. Destina. Dr. Destina and I are still working together. So that's good. Uh, so I think Prof, Prof Nina talked about the the source of her first scholarly publication is actually from her PhD. And that's the same for me, like, you know, so after you finish your PhD, you so you have a lot of data that you collected, you need to publish. But I think it really also depends on your supervisor. I think the role of the supervisor as a mentor is very critical. So like, that's why I mentioned Kay actually um, was very critical as a supervisor to encourage me during my PhD study to start presenting at the conference, you know, start with um, conference paper presentation, but then leading to academic publication like journal publication after you finish. So that's the one source of your um, sort of like idea for publication or journal article. If you think about that, the other source will be your research grant. Like if you work on the grant application and research grant um, after you finish your study, that's another sort of like source of inspirations for you to write your articles or your publication. The other thing is uh, if you have teaching experience and also, you know, you can reflect on your teaching and the innovation that you do in your teaching to write something and publish something out of that. Because I think the purpose, the message from Prof. Nina really is really beautiful because I think it's for us, it's actually a responsibility to publish, to share our experience. So other people who wants to do or to learn about research, they can read and, you know, um, or even like build on the work and then extend and expand the work that we did. If we keep it to ourselves, no one will know what we are doing, right? So that's the um, 
one of our responsibility as, as uh, academic scholars is to share our knowledge. So like I mentioned, I think conference presentation networking provides opportunity for us to get to know other people, other people work. And sometimes the invitation actually come through because you had that chat during the conference dinner, maybe have sit some to, to someone next to you. And then suddenly they said that, oh, I'm co-editing co this journal. Would you like to contribute? Because I know your research is also in this, uh, the same field. So, you know, don't stop yourself from going to conferences because you think, oh, I have to focus on writing articles. But conference can be a, a really great source for you to get um, to be known and to also get connected with other scholars. So I think after some time, when, once you have more papers out there, you have more chap book chapters, perhaps you have more contribution, people start to recognize your work, then the invitation will come like you know now probably invitation to journal articles some journals actually can be only by invitation right so we have one journal article that was by invitation i think a few uh, by invitation only so you cannot actually submit without invitation um that's another uh, important topic so I'm just want I just want to show this to show you or to give you an indication when you look at the Google Scholar you can actually maybe uh, follow Prof Nina and follow the, uh, Dr Destina follow Dr Bambang's work and then look at their citation and it's interesting when I look at my own work I think one of the most cited papers is actually the one that's published in the Indonesian Journal uh, Indonesian Mathematics Society. Um, journal on maths education and I, I don't know why probably because I think maybe many of the master students from UNSRI or from UNES are cited that work uh, so it's not necessarily always the one that's published in the Q1 journal because the Q1 journal is um, there's a few Q1 but like the second one is Q1 and a few other people uh, other journal articles are Q1 but it doesn't necessarily be the most cited papers like you know so doesn't mean like you have to start by looking at the very top ranked journal I mean obviously you want to aim high but maybe um, when we finish this master degree or PhD we can also think about um, different journal outlets that we can target our our work so uh, not just limit ourselves to a particular journal just to share with you some of the more recent work so as you can see from the the authors uh collaboration is very important working with others so being part of the research project with many other researchers maybe from different countries as well if possible but if not then you know collaborate with someone your peers for example um usually that will generate more productive out output so for instance um destina mentioned about the arc project that i'm currently working with colleagues so for that project we have publication plan uh, and everyone is um you know sort of like responsible in leading one publication or one journal article and you know take turns in leading that sort of work so um, so this is uh, an example of some of the collaboration with co-author from different countries. Uh, one of my research focus is on lesson study and looking at the perspective of, you know, Australian teachers, but also the Japanese teachers and Japanese researchers. So um, the second example is from actually our um, resolve project. So assessing reasoning, assessing mathematical reasoning with uh, Professor Colin Bell from Monash University. So I think I touch on the point about increasing the likelihood of invitations is by going to conferences, joining different um, group or different network like you know societies. So when I, I was still I just finished my undergraduate degree, I joined, for example, the uh, it's called, I think, Al Jabbar Group or something like that. So it was established by Professor Wahyuni in uh, Universitas Negeri Gajah, Mada, eh, Universitas Gajah Mada in Jogja. So it's pure mathematics focused, but because my uh, bachelor degree undergrad 
thesis is on pure mathematics so i joined that group and you get to know like you know very very smart people but also very influential people very uh, active researcher so that is one way to learn and to be mentored to find someone who shares the similar interests with you in terms of your research trajectory um, so international research collaboration if you have any opportunities to reconnect we have fellows here from other countries for example make sure you you reconnect and then you know keep in touch even when they go back and you know keep the research collaboration active because that's very important um I think I mentioned about the network of professional associations. So I was a member of Indonesian Mathematics Society, for example, and uh, Merga in Australia and uh, Australasia, actually. Uh, ICMA is the mathematical modeling. I'm not very active at the moment. And then um, I also usually presented at the teachers conference in math uh, mathematics teachers conference. Or if there's any opportunity, for example, to um, deliver a workshop for teachers, you might, you know, do that work and then write about the experience working with teachers as as the result of that work. So some questions that we can consider. I think when we write, I think one of the important things that we have to ask ourselves is what is the problem that we are addressing um, in the in the paper? Yeah. So if we think about think about okay, teacher professional development or teacher professional learning, there's so many papers already on that topic. So what is the, the problem that we are trying to address in your context or in the current state, like, you know, with the chat GPT generative AI, there's so many issues, for example, um, about writing. Um, so th there might be a specific issue that is quite niche to your area and your context. So that will increase the likelihood of publication if you have a very unique position or very unique uh, kind of like contribution to, to the study. So how do I look at the significance of my work is another important point because as a reviewer, uh, I think some of us are doing some reviewer work for journals or for uh, you know book uh, publishers. So when we review articles, often what we ask is, okay, is this a significant work? Is this something that you know uh, important to to be out there and for people to know and to learn? Or is this just a repetition or something in a different context? So uh, not just copy and paste, like, you know, I do some work in um, Melbourne school and then I repeat it in um, Indonesian or Jakarta school and that exactly the same. Then there's a question of what is um, the significance, right? So you have to think about that. And it's not an easy question to answer sometimes. So what conversation? am I in and where am I standing? That's about your positioning of your research in terms of theoretical positions, for example, um, and then um, the theoretical positions, like what theory did you follow? Uh, what positions that you take in, in addressing that research question or the research problem? Um, if we have any practical implication that is addressing that sort of like the next question there what is my argument that's another difficult question isn't it like you know when we write about a research paper where am i coming from in terms of where i position my argument okay so these are ideas that uh baba kemmler Kem already published in 2006 and we cited the work a lot because i think when it's uh it comes to uh writing for academic publication those questions are very uh, crit critical, very key to guide our thinking. Uh, when we publish, when you're about to publish, you finish writing your article, uh, you're thinking about where should I, I submit my paper? Uh, what is important to think is about uh, when you select the journal is to understand um, the readership and the interests of the journal. So obviously if, um, the research is very practical oriented. Probably you want to target more like practical journals, like teachers' journals uh, that have the audience. Uh, the audience is focusing more on you know uh, ideas for teaching, ideas to improve teaching and learning of the students. Uh, but 
if you want to publish um, in the Q1, you know, uh, research journal that focus on methodology, then your methodology section has to be very, very well written because that is the main sort of like um, the reviewer will look at that particular uh, contribution from your paper. Okay. Um, Reader as a discourse community. So I think the, the second dot point is important to be aware of your audience and be aware of what is the discourse of the community. So I think um, the suggestion that I received from my mentors is before you publish, read the journal that you are targeting. So, you know, at least you even sometimes they say like you know you need to cite some of the journal that's pub uh, some of the articles that's published in that journal to really understand that um you know you are not just trying to get your paper published in that journal but also you are reading in, in reading that journal and using that journal uh, to influence or inform your work so that's the second point um angle taking or point of view sometimes we have to make it very clear what is our position in our paper and then contribution to the field this is the difficult question at the end i think especially and throughout the paper i think we have to always think about the question of so what like you know um you cannot just say that okay this uh this research is very interesting very important but the reviewer will say so what like you know what is new? Uh, how is it different? Um, what is the contribution in terms of theoretical uh, position and theoretical understanding, for example? So those are big questions that, um, you know, probably I don't know whether you are ready to tackle those questions yet. But if you are thinking of publication, that's, those are the important questions that we have to consider. Okay, so I think we talk about that before so my experience is when you uh select a journal uh, uh to publish your work first i think um look at the research the journal and identify the purpose of the journal and then explore its ranking so you always have a conversation maybe in your with your um supervisor about you know which journal should i target first what is the, appro uh, the appropriate journal and then you know are you are aiming for um q1 journal or you probably start by local journal in indonesia to get give you experience first and then you, you know for the next publication then you move on to more international journal so have conversation with your supervisor your uh, your mentor to really learn uh, because they are more experienced and then they can guide you and give you some insights and then advice on that Okay, but the important thing is like the journal that you select has to actually fit with the paper that you are submitting um, or you are intending to publish. Okay, so uh, for example, can I think of an example? Um, so for example, the the article that I shared with you earlier about the area and perimeter that's on reasoning study, right? Actually, it was rejected in a few <laughs> from a few journals. So we uh, we sent submitted to different journal, but it was not accepted. So finally, it, we found a place for it to be published. Uh, but yeah, thinking about the the journal that you are aiming for, so that journal, um, the GME Journal of Mathematics Education, published some articles also on. Uh, mathematics education research and also um, focuses on you know mathematical literacy and reasoning so we thought that okay let's go with that journal although it's not a q1 journal it's a good journal to publish um yes yeah, so i think i talk about uh, having experience and read from the journal that you are targeting and then possibly cite some of the uh, papers that's published in that journal if possible Okay, some of the, uh, and this is probably uh, a little bit of uh, an explanation that you might be very familiar with. How many of you have written an abstract for an article or a conference paper before? Okay, quite a number of you. Okay, 
So what do you, what's your experience when you wrote your abstract? How did you start? Can I ask some participation audience? Bambang. Okay, thank you, Pabamba. Anybody? Check. Okay. Anyone want to share? My experience usually I write the uh, paper first, then abstract uh, at the end. At the end, okay. So Pabamba's experience is to start with the paper and then Anybody? write the abstract. Okay, Shifa? Oh, okay. Later. Yes, um, maybe it's a little bit tricky uh, when I uh, write uh, my abstracts for the publications. Sometimes I, ha I haven't um, got the full idea about uh, the full paper, so I just try to check the, uh, the the template of the journals first, yeah. then see what the journal was on the abstract and also on, on, the, on the layout. Then I try to uh, write uh, based on the layout. Then after that, I think for my uh, full versions of my paper. Okay, you. so you start from the uh, abstract, yeah? You get the big ideas and write the abstract and then work on the full paper, Shifa? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. For me, uh, I did it uh, in two ways. First, since we have a lot of assignments, uh, I use... <laughs> I use the assignment papers uh, uh, and uh, make an abstract from the papers. Uh, and the second one, I write an abstract and submit it uh, into uh, a conference and then make it the papers after that. Okay, so you start my conference publication and then conference article and then write a full paper after that from the fellows, maybe an experience that you can share. Yeah, no? Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, in, in my case, I think I do both. Uh, it's proof bumper um, shared. If it is an article, yes, uh, I do write the abstract at the last. However, for some of the conferences, um, I uh, write the abstract, abstract first, but uh, I must have the data and finish the analysis before I can write the yeah. uh, abstract. That's good. That's a good point that when even when we don't have the full paper, especially when we submit a, a conference paper, sometimes we have to submit the abstract first. And then uh, when the abstract is accepted, then you write the full paper. Yeah. So but then for writing the abstract, we still have to have the data to write the abstract. That's a good point. Anyone else have the, another idea that they want to share? All good? Okay, so let's look at the um, write, writing abstract for academic journal articles. Um, it's important, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely important. But um, we have to write persuasively because we have to convince the reviewer of the journal article that, you know, Sometimes the, the editors, before it goes to the reviewer, it goes to the editorial team, right? And if the editorial team probably don't have much time, they probably scan first from the abstract. And then if the abstract is not persuasive, they might think that, oh, it doesn't fit with the journal genre and the journal audience of the journal. So abstract is very important. Uh, so um, what is but it's very difficult actually to write a good abstract because it has to actually capture the the uh, the full paper in a tiny text right uh, in a short form so um the the potential is very very big so this is the suggestion um and we learned this at Deacon also every time we had the uh, workshop for writing for publication usually we refer to this uh, work um, in terms of the move to write an abstract or the, the key, key components of an abstract. So first component is to locate, right? Locate the paper. So uh, introducing where the, what is the focus of your study, uh, the context of your study, that's uh, to do with the, the locate. So specific paper in relation to maybe the bigger database or the bigger project. A bigger issue, for example, that could be one. The focus is 
your particular question that you are addressing or the particular problem that you are examining because if you are doing a phd currently after you finish your phd your data is so big you cannot write <laughs> you cannot write your whole phd into one article right that's impossible so what happened is you have to pick and choose what aspect of your data that will be of interest to a particular journal then you uh, you know you write just for that piece or a research question for example so so um when you finish your master degree or your master research or phd research you probably can publish two three four five papers from that uh research only like yeah if you're some people are very very productive <laughs> and they're very prolific they publish more but you know uh, publishing one or two out of your three out of your phd is good you know because then your work is out there so the focus i think i talk about the focus report is um the part where you summarize the the key findings um uh, in relation to your research question that includes also the research methodology the analysis um the sample or the um, the sample or the participants um argue is your basically your discussion and interpretation and conclusion part yeah speculations and you know uh, coming back to the original research question and then spell out your contribution or the significance of your your work uh, so that's an argument so these are some of the guiding questions i'll lead, i'll let you read these questions i'll give you some time to read it um, and then if you have any questions perhaps we can have a discussion so when we come to locate so in abstract maybe the first sentence is about locating you're locating your argument so you need to locate your contribution in relation to the wider debates can this be made very clear in the abstract focus has the abstract focus on the topic of the paper for example is the focus clearly uh, related to the more general problem or the issue of the field what is the argument so the argument is the so what question responding to the so what questions and the significance of the study yeah any questions is that okay does it make sense yeah Yeah, um, you have mentioned uh, four indicators of uh, constructing a good abstract in the publications, locating, focusing, reporting, and also argue, uh, uh, arguments. But uh, most of the journal, they as, uh, required us to uh, write very concise abstract. And sometimes it's quite challenging to uh, construct our abstract cons uh, concisely and also persuasive. So uh, could you give us a little bit of tips how to reflect those elements in our abstract? Yeah, that's a very good question. I know the abstract is usually only 150 words, maybe sometimes 100 words. Some journals probably have up to 200 words. So very, very, very short. So I'll give you an example in in the in the next uh, few slides. So this is the skeleton. I hope that this is useful. So the skeleton is um, the word that you can or the sentences that you can think of to complete to try to complete to be able to address that particular issue. So for example, the locate the first point is to be very clear about the significance right your contribution. So maybe this dot 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 about your research or the quest research question is a significant issue in indonesia because blah 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 so that could be one sentence okay in this paper focusing the focus in this paper i focus on that's another sentence two sentences <laughs> and then the the, the uh, positioning of the paper uh, is drawing on like you know the theoretical framework or the conceptual framework that you use for the paper um you can start by a sentence like that like you know the paper draws on con social constructivism or like you know um 
Destina and I are currently working on a research project on spatial reasoning. So that kind of, um, you know, we have to identify what is the, the theories that we are uh, positioning our work on, like drawing on. Um, so that's a sentence that we can sort of like use to, uh, and then the argue is, um, this paper argue, or you can use different sentences, but that's kind of like the skeleton to make, to, to capture all of that. Uh, so maybe five sentences, um, one sentence for each uh, sort of like point. So this is an example of one of the journal article that we published out of the uh, lesson study project uh, with Susie Grove, uh, Colin Bell and Brian Doig. So this is actually only an internal Deacon project. It's not an externally funded project. Uh, but we had collected data over two years, three years with teachers in Australia. Uh, it was published in 2017, but it took us a few years to work on the analysis and publication. Um, so you can see the abstract is not very short, uh, but the first sentence is acknowledging the gap, basically. So you, if you can see, the lesson study is high. This lesson study is not new. Like it's been in Japan for more than hundred years, right? So it's not a new a new piece of work. But you can say that it's highly regarded, yet it remains under theorized. So the the paper here, we are making an argument that we still need to work on um, publishing, or you know, this this uh, piece of work is going to contribute because um, lesson study research is still under theorized so you kind of like position the identify the gap in the field and then the second sentence you can see that what do you think is in terms of the four point what is the second sentence trying to do is it locate or focus okay yeah so focus so examines so what is the focus of the paper Examines, I know, I'm sorry, it's a bit small. <laughs> examines the professional learning experiences of teachers and numeracy coaches, blah, 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 right? And then the third sentence, it maps the interconnections between the experiences and their beliefs and practices using, what is that? In a way, it's kind of like positioning the theoretical the theoretical uh work isn't it because we're using that model uh in analyzing the data so you identify the position of the paper by drawing on the um the people that we work on so as you can see it doesn't mean like it's only one sentence per per uh key component that we talk about you can expand it it might need more than one sentence but you know, each sentence have to have a purpose. Okay, so that's the key point. I will also want to share about the experience. So yeah, journal art, uh, academic publication is not an easy task. <laughs> it's a lot of work and also it's a long process. Uh, um, in my experience, it takes a while to get published uh, from the beginning work until um, the end result, probably at at least one year, I think that usually more than one year. Um, and often you get rejected the first time you submitted your work. So don't get discouraged, everyone get rejected, <laughs> don't worry. Even the professors got reject, rejected, right? So it's not just uh, because you're novel researchers, you're still a student, um, you submit your paper, you get rejected. No, everyone got rejected. No, don't worry, like, you know, I got rejected many times, like my paper got rejected many times. So, and also often if you're lucky enough, you are not rejected, but you have, revisions, always revisions, yeah? So the JMT paper that I shared with you earlier, that has minor revision, but actually the feedback was very extensive. <laughs> so it almost feels like a major revision, but I mean, finally it was published. But when we first read the reviewers comments, it was like, oh my gosh, it's a lot of work. Um, 
but it's very useful. So some of the reviewers, actually, the constructive reviewers will identify the area that we need to work on to improve the um, the clarity of the paper. So for instance, in this, um, in the, I'm just sharing with you the feedback. So they say that the structure of the presentation uh, of the results not very clear. So we need to work on uh, the structure of the presentation. And then also they talk about methodology and then the, the, the use of the framework in the paper um, need to be more clear, I think, and they they make suggestion. So sometimes when you receive reviewers' feedback, you have to reflect and think about: Can I address the comment or the feedback? Is it possible for us to actually address the feedback? If we cannot address the feedback and we cannot follow the suggestion, we have to say why and then what is the alternative. Um, it's okay. We can we can reject the suggestion because like there's sometimes like um, reviewers. It's a bit also some can be quite silly because sometimes they say like oh the methodology is not um, very appropriate. It would be good if you do this instead, but it's not possible because your research was already completed, so you couldn't change your methodology. So there are things that sometimes you have to. Uh, argue back and then say that oh okay i wouldn't be able to follow that because blah 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 so you justify your thinking and reasoning um so again another example so this is an example of a paper where it's actually based on the teaching experience that we you know during covid we had to modify our teaching we have to think about uh, oh no actually not just before covid actually not just because of covid but because of i think um this is because we have um, a, three students who don't have any teaching staff in the particular campus. So we have to modify our teaching. So we have to teach the unit using a hybrid mode. So it, which means that I have a face-to-face -face participants like students like here in front of you are the face-to-face -face participants, but also have the online participants like today. So I don't. I hope I don't forget any anyone online. So if they have any questions, please feel free to ask later on. So this is a, a paper based on that experience and reflection. Uh, okay. So how much time do I have, like Resina? Maybe I'm too slow. Ten minutes. Okay. Okay. So. These are some of the guiding questions. If we want to write an article, think about our audience, I think, and think about what do we want the readers to remember about our work, okay? So that is very important to think about. Um, we, we don't write paper just so that, for the purpose of writing paper, but we, we do want to publish something so others can benefit or, you know, we want to share the research that we are doing. So. Yeah, the, the first question I think is very practical, but also very important. And then the added value of knowledge is another thing that is often quite difficult because if it's a study that has been done for many, many years and has been repeated many times, what is the value added um, of my research? How can my research add something new or something different? But you don't have to be discouraged because every Every research, even though you're using the same theory, um, you still come from a different angle and you know you use different sets of data. Your participants are different. So there might be something very unique about your study that others haven't uh, published before. Okay. So I think the third dot point is actually quite challenging because often we have too many data, right? Too big, that our data set is too big. How do we think about uh, which data that we would be very interesting and also very uh, very useful and very you know have the likelihood of getting published uh, or getting traction for our our work? So that is thinking about how do we select uh, which data to publish and then to assist myself in developing an argument. So I think if you submit an abstract for general uh, on a, for a conference, you can always build on the abstract to a full paper. I think many of you talk about that experience before, so that's quite common. I might skip this one because it's quite uh, quite long. 
So I talk about the importance of being persistent. I, I, I share with you the experience of being rejected, right? Many times, not just once. <laughs> so I think the key message, and as a student as well, I think um, if you fail, you get up and try again and do better, right? Work harder. So I think I remember someone said that, like, you know, when you do a PhD, it's not if you finish your PhD, it's not so much because you're too, too smart or so smart, but it's only people who finish is because they really work very hard. So they, they have that persistence to because PhD is like up and down. Yeah, it's, you always have an up and then a down always, you know, in cycles. So you have a good time, very, very excited, very energized. But there are times where you feel like, oh, I don't think I make any progress. I feel like I'm getting nowhere. So that's where you feel like oh, my motivation is going downhill. Um, but everyone faces that. Like, you know, that's everyone experience. So don't be discouraged. Be persistent. I think that's the key, key message. I think like if you get rejected, try again. Um, try another journal. You will find a home if you keep trying. Okay. I might skip this one. It's just a, a comment to show, uh, like, you know, when we're responding to reviewer, we always have to think about the question that they raise and the, uh, the message that they have. So learning from rejection, it is part of our journey. So rejection is part of our journey. So I was going to go through some of the reasons for rejections, and this is some of my reflections as well. So. First of all, if we are not very clear about the contribution of the study, um, or we don't engage with the audience of the journal, most likely the editorial team will say no, like the main editorial uh, team will say that, oh, I don't think this paper fits with the audience of the journal. Uh, so that is the first reason, either the contribution is not clear or you submit it to the wrong journal because the, uh, the paper doesn't really relate or it's not relevant for that journal. So that's the first reason. The second reason for rejection is you say, or you promise a big thing. You're saying a lot of things, <laughs> yeah? Saying everything, but the focus is not very clear. So lack of focus, so that's, often also the second um, reason why the paper is rejected. And then the third reason, and often I also notice that when, you know, um, students write their assignments, um, the organization, the organization of idea is not clear. So the paragraph structure is very important. And I notice like when uh, we write in different cultures, we tend to write differently, right? Um, some cultures think that, you know, the best writing is when you write in a not so direct way. So you kind of like your message is hidden and then people can actually learn after several, reading it over and over again, <laughs> but not in academic writing in English. You have to be very clear. So if you can say it in one sentence, say it in one sentence, don't use the whole paragraph. Yeah, because that's the lack of focus. Um, you signpost, you don't want to repeat the same thing over and over again. So you don't say it in the introduction, say the same sentence in the methodology, say the same sentence in the uh, conclusion, because that's a repetition, okay? But you can signpost, uh, signpost to different parts. The other reasons, you can read it, um, you don't convince the reader, especially the methodology is not very clear or not very strong uh are not very well explained so that's another reason um be careful with your conclusion as well because conclusion often we we tend to over generalize or say something that is not in the scope of the paper so uh, but if that's the case then usually the reviewer will pick it up right but i will say that i don't think you can say that because your paper or your data doesn't won't support that uh statement or that, that claim too local. Um, if you submit to international journal, you cannot um, have a paper that is very local. Like you know, so you have to position your research or your paper in the international audience. Um, so 
if it's too local, then maybe publish it in the local journal. That would be the more appropriate channel. So I think be, be aware of those uh, uh, key point, I think. So this is where I want to stop and hear from you. Uh, does anyone have any journal that they are, journal article that they're working on? And you know, what journal you're targeting? Any uh, main message that you um, want to convey? in your article what's the significance have you think about the so what questions do you have any answer and who cares that's a very very hard questions to answer but i care very much about my 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 research but will anyone care like you know that that's a another question how do you relate to other people and make it make sure that other people can see the benefit of your research for their own work i think that's that's it. Uh, this is just some of the things that I already mentioned. Try to find a mentor, be part of a group, uh, maybe have a writing group or a research group uh, among your colleague and then persevere. I think I already talked about that. Find time, Bunina, Prof Nina talk about finding time. Yeah, um, it's not easy. So thank you everyone for your time and your, your patience. I hope there's something that is useful there. Um, and I would like to welcome your uh, questions or your comments or your concerns. Thank you, Buanti, for a very insightful uh, lectures. I learned a lot also. I keep looking back at what I did. And yeah, I think there are many things that I need to revise. I have paper with Pak Bambang waiting also and then working with uh, Bu Wanti also and I got just now a major revision after four times rejection oh my god <laughs> so yeah that's uh, everyone have that okay so that's the experience um so Bu Wanti brings uh lots of fans from you know, no I mean like those who already asked uh ask question uh, earlier we want to ask question whoever already give a question or give respond remember to get one from me and then if others have another question then i will hand it one we don't have much uh so i don't think every single person can get so those who can put respond then we will give one but, all right so if there is a question first You can put comments also, if not questioned. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. So I will introduce myself. My name is Susilo. Uh, I'm a student in Faculty of Economics and Business, but I'm interested with this topic because next year I will do for my thesis. So I need to publication about my research area. So as we know that, uh, no, I'm still struggling about publication because um, in this month, I have got to uh, acceptance from the journal, but I'm still, uh, how to say, like, uh, struggling in major efficiency. So my question is, I have two question here. So how many papers should we collect to support our, our literature review in paper and journals? So the second question is how to find our novelty in research and in field current issues uh, for instance, in education, because before uh, I came here, I was a teacher in education, uh, even though I'm not uh, in education background. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations for getting accepted. Like, that's very impressive, like, you know, to get two papers, all the major revisions, but it, it's acceptance is very hard, I think. Yeah, so well done. So, um, yeah, so I think how many how many papers do you need to include in the literature review that's a good a big question because i don't think there's a single correct answer like you know five or ten or twenty but i think what is important is to actually um draw on the the papers that are relevant for your research question so you know the research that you you you're doing or you you uh, the questions that you include in that paper uh and the theory theories that you know you align with or you position your work um i think that's more important than the number of citations i would one suggestion i think in terms of the paper that you cited is to go back to the original 
Um, so, for example, if you talk about constructivism or social constructivism, it's always go good to go back to the original source, like Vygotsky or whoever is the key uh, seminal theorist. But then you also have to think about what is the current research after that, because there are a lot of development. So who are publishing now in that work that relates to you? Because it has to be, uh, you have to connect to your own study. So it cannot just be someone um, is doing that work. It seems to be good, but might not be uh, very suitable for you. So I cannot really give you any particular number. Obviously, not, not one, <laughs> I think. Usually, I think uh, it will be more than five, probably. I think because usually a list of references is quite quite big yeah, for one paper like uh but you don't also want to to have too many so i think be, be selective as well and just make sure that it's relevant for your for your uh research question yeah. and then the second question is about what is the new is it novelty yeah, that's a hard one actually to think about. Like, you know, so um for for from my experience, for instance, Hi, in various projects, um, the novelty can come from the way we use the model in analysis. So, like, you know, uh the data, like the lesson study paper that I share with you. Um the lesson study is not new so it cannot come from that angle so we use and the ipmg model the interconnected model for professional growth is not new very highly cited paper uh, but we use it in a quite different way i think that's why it's it gets published and i i think it's quite well cited as well that paper but i think because we try to use the data and try to uh use the model to map the data and analyze it and show the connections with the teacher's growth. So that is the way that we can approach novelty. I think is even though the framework is not new, the data is probably not too special probably, but you can always think about how you use the framework differently in positioning and analyzing your data, I think. And that comes out as, as something novel. But you have to be uh, explicit as well. If you notice that, you have to be explicit in saying this is uh, this is quite different than how other people uh, approach the analysis. If that makes sense, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Bill Ogidwan. Uh My question is: uh, What factors? make a journal too local i mean what are the factors that make a journal too local okay yeah that's the question thank, thank you thank you okay so when you select the journal what what do you consider to choose that journal isn't it yeah is that your question okay okay that's another good question actually so for from my experience it really depends on the research right um so coming back to for example the lesson study uh, article we look at because it's about teacher professional journal uh, professional learning or professional growth and in mathematics education then we have we want to publish in mass education journal and we look at um different journals uh obviously you start with the higher one <laughs> so you know q1 so we, we think that oh, okay maybe journal of mathematics teacher education we'll try that one and see how that goes so so i think that's usually you think about your own research what is the key contribution where do you think it will fit and you know uh, identify several journals so i can give you another example like the other paper with uh, colleagues at deacon that's focusing more on methodology so it's not so much on empirical data analysis thing but um our main main point is the contribution to the video research methodology so the the way we use video to capture the data and work with teachers in school so that's why we decided to go for another journal because that's not going to be appropriate for that journal so it really depends on the the data that you have that you want to publish and the audience you know is it mainly researcher or mainly teacher um, if it's teacher then 
go with the teacher's journal. So we have a, a an article that's published in teacher's journal, for example, in the science education journal, because it's about interdisciplinary maths and science in secondary school. So it was, yeah, it was also rejected in several paper <laughs> journal. So, but I think you, you might get, get your paper published in, not in the first choice of journal that you, you select it, but that, that's okay. I mean, like, you know, you grow that experience um even though it's not the top ranked journal you start somewhere and then you build up i think yeah hopefully that answers your question thank you any other question and then how about time okay oh, two more okay okay thank you uh, my question is what the aspect we must write in abstract when we submit on scopus q1 Based your experience, thank you. Based on my experience, I think yeah, I think the if I can go back, let me see. I have to reflect back on my own experience. I think it's some time ago now. I don't think it's working. Oh, is it okay? Okay, let me see my so this examples that I had. This is the literature review section, so that's not a good one example. Maybe we we'll look at this one, right? So this is a. Uh, a paper that's published together with colleagues from Deakin uh, and Colin moved already to Monash at the time, I think, but it's a, from our reasoning project. So you can see um, it's a journal article. Uh, I think this journal is Q1 still, not to show it, it, it. I think Merch is still Q1, isn't it? Destina, do you know? Merch, is it Q1? Q2, okay, yeah, it, it was Q1 at one stage, but maybe it's going back to Q2, okay. So, um, so I think if you see the sentences, so the first one I think is really identifying again the gap. If you can see um, maybe this part, it's a bit small, yeah? Okay, sorry, uh, but if I can read it. So the sentence, the first sentence is engaging students in comparing, contrasting, and forming conjecture and generalizing and justifying is critical for developing uh, or to develop their mathematical reasoning. But there are untapped opportunities for primary school students to improve these reasoning processes in mathematics lesson. So the second part of that sentence actually identified the gap, isn't it? Like untapped opportunity. So I think the first sentence, if you can make it very punchy, really focus or uh, point out what is missing that you are trying to address. So, you know, we say that, we acknowledge that the, the first part of the sentence acknowledge that it's not new but there are still gaps. So which are the gap? You talk about the gap, identify. And then the second sentence is about the methodology through a case study, right? Um, and then the third sentence or the, the yeah, yeah. The, the second sentence also methodology because it talk about the participants, about the, um, the, the framework. And then the third sentence about the finding, what the finding reveals in this uh, paper. Okay, and I think fourth and fifth is about the implication and what's new, I think the implication. So as you can see, not too many sentences, quite short, uh, but each of the sentence I have a purpose and it has a particular focus, like, you know, whether it's locate, it's argue, it's uh, position, uh, what is it, the word? I cannot remember now. Yeah, the four uh, abstract move. Uh, does it make sense? Yeah? Well, I'll have to try and try. I, I don't know how many times I revised the paper. <laughs> I couldn't remember, but definitely went through major revision. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I just want to share my experience uh, being a teacher or lecturers in Indonesia. Uh, you have been mentioned about uh, being too local in our topic, and it's quite a little bit difficult for us to publish in international journal. But as an educators, uh, our context is always all very local, especially as an Indonesian teachers, we have to contextualize our research in um, our own school, for example. So, uh, can you explain more? Does it about the topic or uh, the context or the uh, respondents of our research? That's number one. 
Yeah. Number two, about uh, you have been mentioned about the uh, strategy how to uh, get uh, attention from the uh, reviewer and also the editors of the journals. One of the indicators is uh, by uh, citing their uh, 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 literatures in the journals. So how is it effective? Uh, because sometimes uh, our targeted journals. Uh, maybe uh, it hasn't uh, talked about a certain topic or areas but we really want to publish at the certain journals but uh, so that we uh, did not um, uh, take some uh, 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 literatures from the journal so how is it effective uh, or can you explain more about that thank you okay very good questions uh okay so when i um that's the first question is about what do you mean by local isn't it yeah so i see i i, I think going back to the google scholars and looking at um the, uh, the papers that's published and where it's published you can get a sense about like you know um this paper like all more, many of my paper actually is in an indonesian context as you can see um it's using Indonesian context. The first one obviously is published in Indonesian journal, but like for example, this one, I just came back from Rexam, right? Rexam conference in uh, CMA Rexam in Malaysia in Penang. So that paper, the, the role of context and teachers questioning to enhance students thinking, actually that was initially a, a conference paper in Rexam, Rexam uh, so Cosmet 3 um, in 2000, 2009. The many years ago, <laughs> uh, 14 years ago, there was a collaboration. The data was collected in Indonesia, right? In Jogja, I think in Jogja. So through the Realistic Mass Education Project in Indonesia. But I collaborated with uh, Prof. Zan in Padang and uh, Martin Dog from the Netherlands. So I think the data can be local in Indonesia, but the way you discuss the findings and how you position the, the study in terms of the, the contribution to knowledge cannot be local. Because if it's local, then you won't go anywhere outside the local journal. So you can use local data, Indonesian data, perfectly fine. But I think it's the discussion point where you connect with the literature. It cannot be just citing Indonesian papers because if you only cite indonesian papers or indonesian studies you cannot go to international journal it doesn't make sense because the readership doesn't align with the the, the paper that you submitted which relates to your second question actually so the second question asks about um when you target a journal and you want to cite the do you have to cite basically a paper in that journal i think the recommendation in some journal i think recently we submitted one that actually explicitly asked you to identify whether or not you cite from that journal if you don't then you have to say yes i don't have any any pub yeah but i think that raises probably to the editorial team a question why you want to publish in that journal that that's probably I'm just guessing, but I think the perspective from editorial team is why do you want to publish in this journal if you never, you never, you know, sort of like cite any work that is published in this journal. So kind of like the come back to the point of audience, the readership. So I think understanding um, the work that's published in that journals by citing the work is, is quite a, a good strategy, I think. Yeah. So try that and see how that goes if if there's nothing in that journal that speaks to your research maybe that's not the right journal for you to publish yeah okay i think there's another question oh yeah and then there's another one what time is it? okay okay Okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Faradila Haryani. Uh, I'm coming from PhD program in educations. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm coming from mathematics education background as well. Thank you. So I'm actually going to ask about the timeline when we are actually writing about or targeting about the publications. Um, it can be in the when we are in the PhD or if we are receiving the grants so um 
reflecting on my experience when I uh, got the grants from Director of Higher Education, um, it's quite it's quite a rush for me because I'm not starting uh, my uh, research until I got confirmations that my uh, proposal is being accepted. But it comes to me, um, it's uh, quite a rush. And then I actually uh, share the experience to other recipients of the grants as well. And they said that I'm actually uh, applying the proposals when I have uh, finished my data collections. Because in some ways, um, I'm actually a little bit reluctant to start my research uh due to the financials problems for example or maybe like uh the scope is too big if we do not have any confirmations from the providers especially from the fund provider it's going to be very hard uh hard for us as well so i'm going to ask you about how you are actually um create the timeline especially when you are receiving the grants uh, and also when you are targeting about the publications, for example, like Q1, uh, how you are actually um, planning about that kinds of the timeline? Thank you. Thank you. Very important question. Yeah. And this is a, I'm still learning. I'm not super good in this, so I'm still learning. But I think um, if you are in, if you are doing a project with colleagues, yeah as a like a big if we run like a team like a project team you have a team usually the uh it's very important at the beginning of the discussion when you start the project to have a publication plan so and then divide and conquer <laughs> divide and conquer means like you know you divide the the the, the key interest or key area and then each of the project lead probably lead one paper and then you you have include everyone's name so then it means like you you have multiple paper under your belt when you finish the project the timeline timeline is quite tricky um i think you touch on the um the issue of scope and understanding what is the realistic scope of a study phd study that you know, it depends on the funding, depends on the time. I always recommend to my PhD student not to be too ambitious. PhD is limited by the number of years. You cannot go on forever. So, you know, it's only three to four years. So you cannot you cannot have a study collecting a thousand data. Yeah, that's not realistic because you don't have time to analyze the data. You know, you're never going to finish. So um, you have to have a realistic scope like you know if you're doing in-depth interview maybe 10 10 is a big number already yeah? so, so I have to think about what is reasonable what is realistic um, I think like Prof Nina um, comment earlier at the opening um, sometimes having a deadline a strict deadline and create that deadline for yourself helps you to finish the work uh, you know push you to finish the work because we are also busy and writing is the first thing probably you drop uh, research uh, i think when we are busy traveling or uh, you know it's not easy to actually be very because it, you need to concentrate you have to have a thinking time right it's not you cannot just write i mean for me writing is a slow process i'm not a very fast writer so i do need time to analyze and usually i analyze a lot of time and then also read you know when you read a journal article you want to read this other one you know it becomes bigger and bigger so you have to kind of like create a timeline say but it's just um it's not going to be fast like you know especially if you're targeting a q1 journal one year is very fast for a Q1 journal. I think it's probably two years for one. That's why I think when we have a project and then they said like, oh, I'm going to publish three journal articles within one year. That's impossible. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Unless if you are a very prolific writer, then maybe, yeah, I can. I mean, I'm not a very prolific writer, so I'm a bit slow in writing. So, But I think having a clear timeline, set a deadline, um, if you get the invitation, I think that's usually helpful because they have deadlines <laughs> and then we have to submit within the deadline. So that is usually quite helpful. Oh, okay. You can have a conversation after if you want to. Yeah, like, 
Oke, okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Doctor. It is very quite very interesting topic that I'm waiting for this event. I am Novinta Nurul Sari from PhD program. Actually, this is related to my experience related to write the publication. I want to ask: Is there a framework or tips for creating a well-structured introduction so that can capture the reader's interest? And then so that the harmonization of the gap, novelty, and literature framework becomes something coherent but interesting. That's yeah, my question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question again. <laughs> I think from my experience, I usually read um, some of the journal article that uh, I find it very, very insightful. Like, you know, you, you, you can see some of the papers that are very well cited. They probably have a very clear introduction, very well structured and organization of the idea, very coherent and concise as well, and not waffle. Like, you know, as a reviewer also, we don't want to read papers that's waffling, like, you know, talk about the same thing over and over again. So I think read is the starting point. Like, you know, you, you have to well be reading a lot of the uh, articles that's published and written quite well to understand how um, the others structure their paper. That's why I think I like the quote of standing on the shoulders of giants because we always uh, learn from others how they they um, they do their work. But you you find your own style. But I think from reading and trying your own, uh, but trying to when we read other papers, see how they actually create that coherence and arguments i always tell my phd students so if you every paragraph very simple suggestion right i think i learned it when i i, I do my ph i did my phd is every paragraph have to have one main point and the main point try to make it very clear at the beginning of the sentence if possible not at the end because you want the reader to know what you are trying to the message that you're trying to convey and say and usually it's at the beginning the beginning is better than the end <laughs> so so but i think sometimes we tend to say too many things in one paragraph so if you have one paragraph saying one thing and then you think about the flow of the argument so you know connecting paragraph one to the next paragraph it has to flow and introduction basically the key purpose of introduction is to introduce your research in a very uh, succinct way and spell out what is um, the new thing that you are trying to address the problem the new uh, the problem the specific problem or the gap that you're trying to address so that has to be in the introduction and you have to maybe mention about the theoretical position and then introduce your research question so your introduction has to be very very short you cannot have two pages, three pages of introduction. One less than a page is ideal, but if you cannot go to up to one page, maybe that's a bit too long, maybe for a journal, but within half a page to a page, you have to go to the literature review or the next section already. You cannot have too long. Because I know that sometimes people write three pages of introduction. It was like, why is introduction so long? It doesn't go, it doesn't seem to end the introduction. Yeah. So that's, I think that's what I can share probably. Thank you so much for the question and the engagement. I'm very impressed with the quality of the questions that you asked today. Thank you. Oh yeah, how many of us today? I think we must have enough for everyone, Destina. Do we have enough? No, we don't have oh, enough. Oh, that one. Unfortunately, we don't have enough. Oh, this one? The... Okay. Uh, we take... Maybe the one who haven't got the souvenirs how many do we have left so i'm so sorry probably i don't have enough for everyone <laughs> they have class so let's take a picture first maybe they just in position uh
buat bikin juga. Oh iya iya. Tikotot, tikotot, tikotot.